Welcome to the Soccer Geeks Podcast, hosted by Jason Barbato. Welcome back to the Soccer Geeks Podcast. I am Marissa Kelly, the producer of the wonderful episodes of all of these and always the woman behind the scenes. And I have my host and extraordinaire and uh, friend. Happy to call hey. you friend, Jason. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks so <laughs> much. Uh, I, I was dancing. I was I was I was I was like starting to stretch the warm up and then I was jo- like running in the go like, let's go. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. I'm so happy to be the host of our show. And uh, really excited for the time we get to spend week in and week out um, sharing what we feel are thoughtful and engaging and insightful conversations that matter around the space Mm -hmm. of the game in the country that we love so much, uh, soccer in the United States of America. And I am. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And I obviously I'm very enthusiastic about it. And uh, I'm really excited about our guest today. Can you let our listeners know who we're going to be talking to and then introduce our wonderful guest? Yeah, so um, we have Larry from uh, Southern California Blues, or otherwise known as SC Blues, Um, and he is the DOC for them, and I think he shares duties with someone else. He told us beforehand, what did Ted? Who did he say? Yeah, Ted. Ted, Ted's kind of, kind of, uh, (laughs) he's kind of taking a little bit of a step back, and Larry's taking a little bit more of the the leadership reins there, which is wonderful. He's been, he's been part of that program for a very long time, so we can't wait to get into the history of that today. Yeah, and uh, you brought him into the loop, and I'm sure you guys will have tons of conversations uh, to talk specifically about the club, but the game specifically. Um, Yeah. I mean, in general. So, um, and generally we'll specific, on. yeah, specifically general. <laughs> we'll do it. Tongue we'll tied it today. It's yeah, okay. It's, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, Larry, welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm doing okay. It, well, I know you said don't discuss the games, but and the first I'm thing not... you're going to do is discuss. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. At the recording of this episode okay. was the first leg of Champions League, where exactly. uh, he was a big Man City fan. You know, <laughs> wins four three, but they're behind on goals, away goals. So here we are, folks. The cat's out of the bag. Uh, right. we, well, we we bank them and bleed them. What can we say on the show? So, hey, we we live the game of, officially. You know, we talk about true. it. We try not to be very specific about timing, but you know, it happens. And every day, there's a lot of work that goes into all of this. So, yep. we got to build up our bank. More yeah. importantly, I'm concerned with my practice today, which is okay. the, my 2009 girls. You know, uh, okay. One of my I, favorites, I, actually. I can't wait to get into that, that part of our conversation today, too, Larry. I want to hear all about the 09s. Awesome. I'll write that down as my next So I'll Larry. let you guys chat. Um, I yeah. will come back with some insights uh, from your conversation and uh, enjoy. And I look forward to learning more about you and all of your insights, Larry. Thank you. Thanks, Marissa. See you soon. Larry, kind of getting into and on-wrapping our conversation here, uh, as Marissa shared, you know, you have a very long history with Southern California Blues, uh, so long that it was a little bit of your your brainchild, if you will. And um, I was wondering if you might just give our listeners um, kind of a, a, a history of establishing uh, the the all girls club uh, here in Southern California Southern California Blues. Sure. Um- I began playing soccer at Cal State Los Angeles. Well, that wasn't the beginning, but uh, that was probably, you know, my major team that I started with. And uh, following my uh, departure to Mexico and coming back, um, I began helping the head coach there, Burhani, Ander Burhan, one of the nation's top coaches and instructors of coaches. And I learned how to coach with him. And then he introduced me to a high school program. I didn't even know girls played soccer. So when I went there, this was what, 1981? No, I was going to ask for a time stamp on that. Okay, It could have been like 83 or something like that. Sure. Anyway, I don't have all my times completely straight. So I went over there and they said, no, 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 this is a girls team. And I said, what? Girls play soccer? <laughs> well, I gladly took the team. I was assisting sure. Burhani at Cal State Los Angeles. And I started the girls team there. And they didn't have a program. So I started coaching and <clears throat> I thought I was doing a good job. Uh, but even though I was teaching them concepts, 
I didn't understand uh, the need for the technical part of the game. Uh, we did passing, we did receiving, we did dribbling, but I never explained to them the form, the technical form with which you do it, and also the creation of time and space for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, my good partner, Tad, his name is Tad, by the way. Tad, okay, sorry, we yeah. said Tad, Tad. Okay. That's all right, he's a Brazilian guy. He We're Tad off. We're a little off. We're just a little off. There you go. <laughs> So he, I had him come out and watch, and oddly enough, Tad was my first coach as an as a goalkeeper coach at college. Okay. So uh, he came out and watched. He said, "You know, Larry, your team is trying to do the right things, but they're not very technical. They don't understand." So I said, "What do you mean? What do you mean?" And he explained to me this concept that I tried to explain to you: the technical part, the form. Uh, once I started working with the kids like on their uh, ability to to escape defenders with balls at their feet in other words dribbling in a very elusive way uh i start to see that they had more time and now the concepts the thoughts that uh i tried to give them they were able to execute them on the field because they had more time and space so one thing led to another uh one of the olympic development program uh administrators uh, came to watch the team and was impressed. And I had the opportunity to start the Olympic development program here in Southern California at okay. under 16. One of my first players that I picked, it was really hard to pick her, Julie Foudy. Uh, you know, so she played and there were a bunch of other stars that, you know, people may know the names uh, or maybe not. Anyway, so from that, <laughs> I met one of the parents and one of the parents asked me to coach uh, their team. And it just so happened that quite a few of the players that were on the Olympic development program uh, were on this particular team. And of course we recruited and I had a absolute bomb squad and it was called the nightmares of Southern California. <laughs> All right. Lady horses of the night. Not, yeah. not nightmares. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they ended up winning all their games and doing really well. And I thought it was me, but I started to realize that it was the players. And so one thing led to another. And when that team graduated, uh, I was coaching in college and I did a Hubert Vogelsinger camp. And then, uh, you know, some of the parents were impressed and they said, hey, would you come to our club here and help us in San Juan Capistrano? And I did that, and we had a great time. And one of the parents who was uh, very well-to-do, I think he owned uh, Rip Curl Wetsuits, he said, hey, would you come and form this club? And I said, sure. And at the same time this was happening, Tad was coaching adult women's soccer in Torrance, and he coached a team called the uh, Blue Jacks. That was a team that he started uh, these collegiate players didn't have any place to play once they finished. Right. Right. So they would come and play in this adult league. And uh, I, we, we decided to bring these things together. Our first concept was to uh, use this youth division as a feeder system for the adult team. But it's very difficult. We're in a, I, I hate to insult anybody, but I will. Um, we're, in a third, we're in a third world country when it comes to soccer. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's changed quite a bit and everything sure. has improved tremendously. But we used to play these games and, you know, uh, uh, this club started then as a youth club and we had like three teams. And uh, we took one team and we split them and then we had a tryout and one thing led to another and we started adding teams. But I would say that the the one of the very important qualities that the club established was to create and this was before professional coaching most coaches were just coaching you know amateur you had a lot of right. parents doing the work yeah dad ball daddy ball yeah correct Mama ball. correct and they were as i mentioned if they had good players they were very good coaches sure you know yeah I think um, Alex Morgan has even said that her dad was her own, her, was her team's coach, you know, in AYSO and Diamond Bar there until she was, you know, 14, 15 years old. So it's not, you know, this, people have to understand contextually, that's just where things were at in the late 80s and through the 90s. I mean, that's just kind of where the game was 
really ramping up and growing. And even the women's program, you know, was, and women's soccer in general was really just getting started in that the 1980s, you know, especially with some of the players that you already named. They were, you know, they're, they're the Mount Rushmore of the game being established on the women's side in the country. They really are. By the way, through that Olympic Development Program contact, I also had the opportunity to coach the women's regional team. And at that time, if you couldn't try out for the regional team, they had an open tryout. And we had Michelle Akers. We had, uh, you know, Leslie Gallimore, just tons of players uh, that have come before. So getting back to this youth business, sorry. No, you're Um, fine. Bring it. This is all a wealth of information for us to learn about the history of the game in our country. What I think. And what I think differentiated us a little bit was I came up with this player parent agreement. And <clears throat> when we, when we coach, we always run into problems with adults, parents, kids, communication. Oh. No one, never, and I never, mean, never heard that before, <laughs> but I think it's universal. It's yeah, true with yeah, any yeah. endeavor. Yeah. So right. just like a school, we try to create a policy statement, how we would communicate, how we would make decisions how we evaluated the players. What do we do when we travel? Um, And I was, of course, coming from the soccer background only. The parents went, what? We can't do this. This is too much. It's too difficult. So I gave them some leeway with respect to editing. Uh, You know, I didn't have a parent's perspective. And they said, no, 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 This this will never go over. So I agreed, and basically what it came down to was the soccer part was going to come from me, and this was my club, the Blues. It wasn't that parents hired me to come and coach in a club because if that were the case and your daughter didn't, and you were the president and your daughter didn't make the team, well, maybe i get fired. Right. So anyway, that's where it started. I remember the first day I began – it was raining. It was in San Juan Capistrano at Rancho Capistrano Fields. And I was up for the head coaching job at Colorado College. And we were waiting to see what was going to happen. I was waiting. And as soon as I was a lot younger then, as soon as Tom Lingo, who was the gentleman that I mentioned, a wealthy gentleman, as soon as he gave me a check for $1,000, that was so much money for me. And I said, what? I can coach and kids and get paid to do it? Sure. Oh, I'm, I'm in. On the telephone booth. This is a literal telephone booth. Back <laughs> sure. I called Colorado College and I said, hey, I'm withdrawing. And that was yeah. uh, that was the beginning of uh, the beginning of the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, can you... Oh. I don't know many all-girl clubs in the country, <clears throat> right? From a from a youth soccer standpoint, and I think that that's one. I, you know, as you know, you've we, we you know, so the audience knows as well. Larry and I met a few weeks back at a camp that they did down in the area. My one of my daughters attended to it. We had an hour long conversation in the parking lot, and I was like, "Well, shoot, we should just record this via podcast uh, for our audience here." But I'm a dog. I'm a dad of three girls, right? So that just by nature of the fact that God didn't give me sons, here we go. I'm a soccer dad of girls. Here we go. But I think it's really unique uh, because we don't see many clubs that, I mean, like you said, it's, you can, you know, you're not, it's not lo- so super lucrative to be a soccer coach, but the business of youth soccer is relatively lucrative from a stamp from a business standpoint, if you do it right and you do it well. By cutting off half of a potential client base, you know, uh, of having a, a boy's side to the club, you've you've really focused and said, "Listen, the, the business side's going to take care of itself. We're going to we're going to really focus on the the girls' side of the game." Please tell me, like, I would love to hear your heart and your mindset on this uh, of why you felt it was important, um, and right why you felt like it was not necessarily like your calling, but your duty to just focus on growing the girls' game and having an all girls club because I think that's really valuable. Uh, Going back to, you know, my past and coaching in high school, I just started coaching girls. And what I discovered, uh, this being my first head coaching job, was the love that I got back from those kids Mm -hmm. and the appreciation and the willingness to uh, work as a unit 
uh, they, this may sound sexist, but they say boys are, you know, easy to manage and hard to coach and the girls are hard to manage. And may, maybe that's terrible to say that, but, um, so when I started, it was just natural for me to go right into uh, girls soccer. I had coached men. I coached Cal State Los Angeles Division One men. But what we discovered was that, first of all, all the kids that we were involved with were all girls. We didn't have any boys. I've been approached many, many times by many clubs to join with them. And one of the sticking points is that they have boys. And we... <laughs> Yeah, and my, my friend makes a joke, another terrible joke, uh, that uh, if you coach boys, you actually have to know what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> that's a terrible joke. But it that's is, what people have thought for a really long time in girls' soccer. You just basically show up and go out. It's it's you know it's powder puff, you know cupcake ball, um, which and it's very much that's not the case. Um, how many you know because you are in such a unique um, space there of having an all girls club. Are, are there many notable all girls clubs across the country? Because I, I, I don't know of any, and I'm, you know, I don't know everything. I and mean, you've got a long, longer resume in the game than I do. But is, I mean, are we talking, you know, a hundred? Are we talking fifty? Are we talking twenty across the country? I, I would say there's very few, okay. uh, because as you mentioned, soccer has become such a big business. Sure. Um, and there is the revenue side of it, um, but I, the first one I heard about was the Dallas Sting. Now, you may or may not have heard of the Dallas Sting. They used to wear tassels on their socks. And my desire was always to, they were one of the best, trust me. Yeah. Uh, Mia Hamm played there. And I okay. think Christine Lilly played there. Okay. So, I mean, these were, you know, tremendous players. I might have yeah. my history a little bit wrong. I know that they had quite a few great players. And my desire was always to win one of those games and ask one of the players to give me the little tassel. Did it ever happen? I did it. I did it once. Okay. <laughs> did they give you the well, tassel? Yes, they did. All right. Sure. That's good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there aren't a lot of clubs that are all girls. As I mentioned, we have a brand, and uh, I we didn't really discuss the uniform choice that we have, um, sure. the lime green. Yeah. Um, so we had a brand that we created along with a logo. And we didn't want to taint that. I know it sounds terrible, but we didn't sure. want to taint that with boys or spread ourselves too thin. Yeah. The costs that go into co to uh, having a club are infinite. Right. Fields, goals. And one thing that I've come to understand, because all these clubs have come at me and said, hey, will you join us, is that two plus two has to equal six. It can't yeah. equal four because really you're just taking on other problems. You do know that boys per capita probably fight more on a field than their yeah. parents get angry. Yeah, well, I, I've seen some, you know, some uh, academy girls games. You know, I've seen a lot of physicality out there. But yes, I would say that it's definitely it's a little bit more uh, aggressive, right? Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I really think that it's I. I it's like in and out, right? You know, those of you guys that are listening uh, that are not for Southern California, I'm super sorry for you, but we have an amazing burger chain down here called in and out and they don't have a thousand items on their menu. They have a few and what they do, they do very well. They might not be the best burger or the best fries or the best shake, but the consistency of the product that they put out is very, it's very, it's very good. It's very consistent and you know what you're going to get. And so I think that especially when people are looking to establish clubs or build businesses or do all these other things, you have to you have to start somewhere and whatever you do you have to do that very well. It doesn't have to be better than everyone else, but it's got to be good and it's got to be consistent. So, I kind of see that as being one of your your staples of the club there is that you know, you're not like Taco Bell or Jack in the Box where you have 8,000 different things where you're just trying to find what's the local flavor that everybody wants to get to to draw new new uh, bodies in through the door. You've got a brand, like you said, and you want to make sure that brand is consistent, that you are, you're pumping out, you know, top 10 hits left and right, and that the, the kids are receiving not only just an adequate, but an exceptional soccer education, because it's not just a matter of, you know, them being athletes and getting physical activity. You're also in like, you're also charged with the ability of educating them 
on the game and raising their soccer IQ. And so I would love to get a little bit of your perspective of um, what kind of makes Southern California Blues different in your developmental approach compared to the other the, the landscape that's out there. Um, I'm, I'm regressing here. Is that okay? I can do whatever I, you like. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so, so, you know, getting back to the club and why, you know, this is something I left out. The girls themselves are very proud of their uh, affiliation with the club and the brand. Um, when we first created these uniforms and for you people out there, if you haven't seen them, they're, they're pretty wild. Most people oh, they're, they're fun. Yeah. in the youth soccer community kind of recognize our uniforms. And I've seen a lot of fluorescent colors these days anyway. So they say that, uh, copying is the greatest form of flattery. Yes, they do. Um, it makes me angry. I why are they having fluorescent uniforms? We were first and, but, uh, Anyway, so there's a lot of uh, pride that comes with that. Also, there we have a history of players that the girls look up to. They come back. That's one of the important things. Now we ask alumni or even the senior players to come and work with the younger. So, uh, getting back to the you know the the reason for the all girls club, and I think that's that's an important quality is that you have role models and a history that they can look back on. And if you watered it down, as you mentioned, with uh, other types of burgers, it might not be as good. So, yeah. Well, Larry, we'll get, I, I love, I love what you said there. And, um, and we'll get to the next, we'll get to that question and topic in a second, but you brought up something really interesting and, and I would love to, for, you know, if you, if you had to ballpark the figure for us, because I don't know if you've got a running list in your head, but how many U S women national team players have come through so people understand you're 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 a, you're a small club in a small city in a small little corner of Southern California, uh, but yet you're, the impact on the national pool of players has been massive. So so how many players have come through Southern California Blues that have that have donned the red, white, and blue for our country? Well, remember, there's a lot of levels uh, of sure. the national pool. Yeah. Uh, on the on the main team, on the women's national team, first team, I don't believe anybody. Well, uh, Jenny Branham was one that I can remember. She was a goalkeeper, and she played at North Carolina, won a couple championships there. And I think she was third in the pool for goalkeepers. This is when Brianna Scurry was, uh, uh, you know, the number one. Mm -hmm. uh, however, when you get to international soccer, we've had yeah. quite a few. Okay. Uh, the English national team goalkeeper, her name is Karen Bardsley. She was uh, one of the goalkeepers here. Okay. And the South African goalkeeper, her name is Roxy Barker. She was also uh, a blues player. And then we've had various players from the adult team. Um, actually, Julie Foudy played for the adult blues. Okay. So I can... That's, yeah, we'll it, take some credit for that. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you've done really well. Gosh, man, you're a little bit of a of a Darth Vader there, uh, recruiting and uh, developing these players to play for other national teams. But uh, no, I, yeah. you know, we had a gal on our show recently, uh, Natasha Anasi, who grew up in the United States, uh, went to Duke, um, and ended up going playing professionally professionally in Iceland and became a citizen. You know, the U.S. Women's National Team wasn't knocking on her door to play for them, and, and Iceland did. And so she kind of there was an opportunity there, and she got she's she now represents their country, and she just recently played in the the She Believes Cup for Iceland uh, that was here this last uh, year. Um, but you know, all eyes have been on the United States for quite a long time uh, in in developing, especially uh, players for the women's side. And so, uh, whether they don the red, white, or blue, or whether it's another national team, it's still something. It still says something about the program. Uh, again, a small program from a little from a little old town uh, to generate players on the world's biggest stage. Now, I know once you get down in the other levels of the U twenties, U seventeens, U fifteens, there's still a very long and even more robust uh, of number and players and even college athletes and stuff like that. So, um, there, there, Jason, it's infinite. Yeah. We have yeah. players in all the youth levels of the national pool. Uh, and team. As a matter of fact, on my current 2005 team, I have three players that are participating with the Mexican national team okay. under 17. They get flown down there to Mexico City and they do training and 
and then there are others as well. So yeah, what what people don't understand, especially on the girl side, you know, we see we see it on the men's side. There's a lot of these high profile players that are dual nats, and we get all upset if you know Mexico comes and talks to them or Canada and things like that. But on the women's side, I mean, there's only so many players in the women's national team, and they are they are they are the one of the biggest international sides in the world and the talent is incredibly deep. So those players that especially have the ability to go play for another national team, I mean, a lot of other federations are looking here to be able to find out the ethnic and cultural ties and the familial ties that they can, you know, improve their sides. And so, you know, on the one side, here we are, we're, we're, we're outsourcing our development Right. And that's okay. Like, I don't think that we, I don't think on the women's side that people are super upset or that we're seeing it as a net loss for the program here. Really what it is, is, is we are probably the, the best at developing international players in the United States. Is that, would you say that that's a pretty fair statement? Listen, soccer is so convoluted. I would say early on that was the case. Now, Um, you got to remember our top players don't play in our professional league for the most part. Some do, but others choose to go international and you have professional leagues now that are, you know, I know that, uh, what was it? I was reading that Barcelona women just filled their stadium. 95,000, something like that. And so our our top players now are going to Europe and why are they going? They're actually doing us a favor. Yeah. One of the reasons we started a women's uh, uh, club or, or professional league on several occasions was to give our collegiate players uh, the opportunity to train all year round so that they could compete internationally. Right. Because if they had only played college soccer, which is about a 25-game season at, at best, uh, uh, we're competing against countries that play day in day out with the same team either club or national team yeah so our model may not be the best for soccer and i think it's a model that we develop through other sports because those sports work the kids go to college and those are the training grounds for the professional leagues but not so much here i would say it's the clubs yeah and it it i mean that's a whole other Oh man, that's a whole other show to be honest, Larry, because I've got some really strong feelings about it. I mean, the reality is, is the NWSL is too small. Uh, we have, we have, you know, a hundred men's professional teams in this country and every single one of those clubs should have a female side. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. They, they should all have it. And we have too many girls that are playing college soccer that don't have that upward mobility that have the talent or that are late bloomers in the game. And we're missing out to, to, to really building this thing out smart in Europe, you know, caught up within one world cycle, as far as I'm concerned. So it's, you know, that's not, say, yeah, sorry. Diff- Let, yeah. Let's not uh, forget uh, South America and Mexico. We have two players. One's playing at club America and the other yeah. one is playing, uh, uh, who is it for the, for the Cholos and uh, Cholos, Tijuana. Tijuana. Yeah, yeah. I got to Soccer scarf right there for them. I, I've gone down a couple times to some games. Well, now let's talk about, you know, one of the things just so people don't understand, you know, and our audience don't know that aren't familiar with the club is that, you know, and I've been involved in the youth soccer scene for quite a number of years now here in Southern California. What people don't understand is that zone one, particularly zone one for blues is, is so well respected from an initial technical, tactical, um, tempo, a skill set of implementing a, a, a soccer concepts and building a very, very strong foundation. Can you talk a little bit about what makes Blues so different in their approach, particularly at zone one? And don't take that offensively. I mean, I, I don't mean that you guys do poor at zone two, but zone one is you guys are you guys are el- like elite of elite of elite, like f- absolutely fantastic in that zone. And I would like to know, gosh, what is – you know, what is the, the secret recipe? Like, what is what are you guys doing? You're going to so educate good. me, Jason. You're going to educate me because no, zone awesome. one, zone two, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar yeah. with this. So basically, uh, give me about until uh, U12. So everything under U12. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Well, it's it's difficult concept to put into words, but I often have to do this when I explain what it is we do when I'm speaking with parents or, or other people sure. about the program. Since I played 
first of all, Tad, my partner, is a Brazilian guy. And we grew up, especially in Southern California, playing with Latins, playing South American style. Um, that is where my heart is. I played, you know, in Mexico one or two years. And during my career, my playing career, starting in high school, it was all Latin kids. Uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Peru, Costa Rica, Mexico, of course. And uh, I was a novice. And I went out there and I started, uh, you know, playing hard with my American spirit. I was a goalkeeper, by the way. And uh, the first time I went to one of these guys from El Salvador, I looked down because uh, I got nutmegged. And, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> but, but it was called a tunnel, by the way, because it's okay. Spanish, right? Tunnel, that's what we said. Okay. And so I got upset and I ran after the guy again and he nutmegged me again. So I said, you know what? There's something to this sport. Sure. Yeah. And um, there's also the camaraderie and, and uh, social aspects of playing soccer. I've played other sports, and I found it to be very confrontational. And on the soccer side, I found it to be very uh, together. You know, like familial. There's, there's lot, yeah. Yes, there's a lot of love between the players and goofing around and all that kind of stuff. Anyway. So when you come to the style, it was different because in, in the beginning, when you had adult or men coaching, uh, parents coaching, they were very direct. Uh, they got great results. They had great athletes. But me, I took a long-term approach. <clears throat> Understanding that when you take that long-term approach, especially when the kids are young, they're going to make a lot of mistakes technically and uh, you're going to lose a lot of games. I know this is not a mystery to anybody who has coached or is familiar with coaching. Um, so we began with the emphasis of technique in the sport of soccer. And I always felt one of my jobs or probably my primary, my primary responsibility is to get the kids uh, to a level where they can step up and play at a college program. I mean, that really is the business model of youth soccer these days. We all want to win. We all want to win games and we're all competitive. But <clears throat> if I can get these kids to a level where they can go ahead and play in college, um, you know, I'm going to be extremely satisfied. Uh, my goals will be met. My first priority will be met. Yeah. And so how do you do that? Well, <clears throat> playing the way that I ask my players to play, and again, it's more difficult now because there are so many clubs, so many teams. Um, I ask them to maximize their repetitions of receiving, passing, and dribbling, not necessarily in that order. Uh, and by doing that, we, the players under pressure have an opportunity to use that as like a, a classroom, if you will. Um, the game would be the test, the practices, the classroom. And uh, I, I am adamant about players playing with thought and not necessarily emotion. I don't mean emotion in getting fired up for the game. I mean, once you're playing, there has to be a conscious part of the game where you make decisions based on what you see and not how you feel. Right. And so if I don't want to make mistakes... The easiest way not to make a mistake is to just, you know, boot the ball forward. And sure. now I've gotten rid of my responsibility. Whereas because of my soccer background and playing in this certain Latin style, I overemphasized the movement of the ball. And to some, it was a detriment because we ended up not getting results all the time. But what happened was as the players continued to do this i didn't let them escape from that responsibility and i insisted that they do that and it was unorthodox as coaching sometimes is in our in our sport yeah. uh as the players matured they started becoming faster and faster and faster with respect to the pattern of play and uh we started getting results as well of course we had dis uh, detractors but Sure. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things, and, you know, you can see it on the field when players are playing out of fear. 
fear that they're going to get yelled at by their parents, fear, fear that they're going to be yelled at by their coaches, fear that they're going to just make a mistake because they know that if they make a mistake, they either are going to get put on the bench or they're going to get screamed at. And I've seen this from seven year old kids to 16 year old kids. And it's, I mean, it, you have to have that long runway. And I, I, you know, to all the parents out there that might be listening to podcasts and all the players, you know, uh, your kid is not the sum of the mistakes they make on the soccer field and neither is their playing career. You have to have a long runway. You know, they are very unpolished and unfinished products. And you've got to give, yellow, I had something fall here in the studio. You've got to give kids um, enough time to work through some of those things. Um, Absolutely. And the opportunity. the opportunity. Yeah, they just have the opportunity, opportunity, opportunity to make mistakes yeah. and the opportunity to play and practice yeah. in an environment of peace where yeah. they're not afraid to try something, they're not afraid to make a mistake. But it's rare because our culture is so yep. results driven. And my, you know, my training in education taught me that learning is not a plateau. In other words, you don't just stop learning because you can't see the changes being made. They're going on, you know, chemically and electrically inside your brain and in your mind and in your body. And as soon as those things make the connection, you're going to start seeing the growth again and you see the breakthrough when they start playing, but who knows what's going on in there. And at that time, people are saying, well, they're not getting better. They're not winning their games. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. So this is a product of teaching and also a product of having to educate parents to look yeah. at things from a long-term approach. Yeah. It's not our it's not in our DNA and nature to do that. You know, we no. want instant gratification. And as a as a as a parent, a soccer parent mm -hmm. myself and as somebody who's coached a little bit, especially when my kids were young and you know now um, you know going to be getting into just doing some refereeing with my daughter just so she has a summer job and things like that and kind of having a little fun from that sideline. It's been something as a soccer parent I've grown into as well. Uh, being patient and not always feeling that, you know, their, their, their whole career is defined at their, at U10. Like, gosh, if they're not on the first team, if they're not at this club, if they're not doing that, but like having a very, like, not a, not a two of a disconnected approach, but being engaged, but at the same time, who kids can't operate in a vacuum and grow. It's just the fear and the pressure builds. And I've, I've learned a lot as a parent on how to actually just take a step back, focus on the positives. You know, coaches are definitely telling them the things they need to work on and all those other things, but focusing on the things that are building them up and letting the game be the best teacher. Uh, and just for all the parents out there, Larry, maybe you can you can talk a little bit about this, but how is just playing the game the the most fruitful instruction that a youth player can receive? Well, when you come to, you know, we have this word that we use here in our country called development, and we need to be careful about that. I am of the opinion, you know, maybe as a coach, I believe more in the players. And I think most coaches that are experienced will tell you that. Um, so we, there is no sense of development here. There's no one way to develop a player. If there was, one country would win the World Cup every time. And as a matter of fact, we probably would because we're the most uh, organized and structured, you know, yeah environment that you could ever find for for just about anything but the sport of soccer uh really the players develop themselves and they do that in my opinion because they have a passion for the sport and when you have a passion you're not afraid of work as a matter of fact work becomes enjoyable and uh <clears throat> we've got to create that environment here uh and it it really doesn't exist that well you know that much so yeah. um in foreign countries players grow up and they play unstructured soccer and they play street soccer and again this is not new to people that are experienced yeah. um and i believe in a naturalistic approach very difficult to do here because again the background of our uh parents and adults is analytical well i can understand this it, it must not work. So, for instance, I used to play a game called um, trash can soccer, okay. which, again, I learned everything from someone else 
Yeah. I played on a Israeli team and the coaches brought out two trash cans. We would run for 45 minutes. Now, again, we were older and then we would play this trash can soccer game with two touch. And so you put a trash can on one side of the field, trash can on the other side of the field, no boundaries. And it's two touch and you have to hit the trash can on any side of the can. So it could be in the front, the back. Imagine all the possibilities. We can chip balls over the can to the other side. There's a lot of teasing, a lot of fun. And if the other team gets organized in front of that trash can, it's very hard to score. So you have to work on moving the ball around, you know, well, and uh, be able to penetrate and all the good things that we do. And then yeah. there's counterattacking. The other team wins the ball. We're not by our can. They run. They try to score. This game is so enjoyable. Right. I loved it. The players enjoy it. They look. I'm sure the kids loved it. Yeah. yeah, they do because it's different. It's not yeah. really organized. It's it's more. I can do whatever the hell I want to do. Pardon the uh, language. Yeah, it's okay. And uh, <laughs> that, that one's okay. That can slip through the cracks. That one's that one will be fine. Yeah. And uh, so the yeah. parents got upset because I used to do this quite often, and they said, well, "What is this? What is this? This is not." You're not teaching anything. You're not. What about their throw-ins and their corner kicks, Larry? What are you doing? Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So, I always found the most fun I ever had uh, with my, with my kids and even as a coach and, and other players in connection with even other parents and talking with their kids who had connected while I was coaching is making games on the fly. Like, all right, let's, let's come up with like three different rules. And when you give kids a little like, all right, well, we can do this and we can do that. And it, listen, you can do this all the way up to the, when they're 17, 18 years old. If, and you have to have a, one, it's got to be fun. And two, they got to have buy-in. You know, kid wants to run when they don't want to run. But can you make the game so enticing to them that they can't help but expend their energy in the joy of playing a, a game that they're creating on the fly. And I think that's where you have to have the structure. We, we just, you do because the game works out, but you have to have these, these moments where they can just be free and express themselves. And, and I think that's such a, you bring up such a valuable point that there, there's the, there's the development side. Everybody was really focused on that, but gosh, if they don't have fun, you know, the kids are just going to drop out because it's just going to seem like a job. And although it's work, you never want it. You never want them to have to feel like they're going to their job when they're going to soccer practice. So, um, I was kind of curious if you might be able. You know, I know you're very unorthodox in that regard, where you've kind of got you have a different approach, um, and that's kind of what has helped. You know, you know what they say about teachers, right? That sure. that you're born, you're born, yeah. and soccer also. You have to have an intuition and a feeling yeah. for it. It's not something you can really study. Sure. You have to be a big kid yourself, I guess, and try to get down to the level of the players that you're working with and have a good rapport with them. And part of that means having fun. Yeah. Uh, I know in the past when I was younger coach, uh, my team might have won a championship um, and I would uh, look at them and they weren't excited. And I would, again, asking other more experienced coaches, hey, how come I'm more excited than they are? They came to the conclusion, I said, well, you know, Larry, you're too hard on them. You don't allow them to have fun and you're so dictatorial. And yes, they were playing great soccer analytically, passing the ball, doing all the good things. But if they're not enjoying it and you don't allow them to have fun, they're not going to want to do it. Yeah. So that's one of my pet peeves is that uh, here in our country, and again, we're getting back to the developmental approach and why the blues are a little bit different. Um, in other countries, they don't play organized soccer when they're young. They just yeah. play, you know, amongst themselves. And uh, the only organization is calling up your friends and going out and playing. Sure. Now, it may not be this way now because, again, soccer has evolved. But the top players in my mind uh, or the best players are uh, from South America and from Africa. And uh, why is it that... If we're so great at developing and our structure and the way we do things is so great, why are these players so much more talented than we are when it comes to the game of soccer? Not necessarily winning, not necessarily tactical uh, awareness, but just if you look at the pure essence of the game, and I can explain what that is in my opinion, uh, they're so much better than we are. And it's because they play, they grow up playing, having 
fun with the soccer ball. There aren't adults to tell them, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. And so the possibilities are endless. And yeah. through that imagination and creativity, that's, uh, I believe that's the culture and environment that allows players to develop. Not that we as coaches are developing players. You know, and thinking about, you know, I, I didn't grow up, you know, playing soccer. I've been pretty honest about that. You know, I, I grew up in a, you know, across from a massive park where you've got a duffel bag and you've got your football cleats, you've got a football, basketball, baseball, tennis racket. You just don't know what we're playing the next day. So, you know, we were, you know, athletes, you know, we just went out and had fun. And I look at, you know, Major League Baseball. I look at the NBA, uh, even look at NFL and college, you know, the we're starting to see more players come in from outside the country as it's become more structured. And it seems that in years past, it's not that players were coming in from outside the country. It's just that we had so many more players that naturally loved and had a joy of the game. Like almost seems that like the more structure we've gotten, you know, our ability to produce top world-class talent in uh, in these other sports has really kind of started to dwindle. Um, And I don't think it's just an import export thing. But I know that, you know, just playing the game and a lot of players uh, that are professionals that I talk about, is the most fun they've ever had on the field is something that was not incredibly structured when it was just them and the ball or them and their dad in the backyard or them with their friends at a game, you know, playing a pickup game or things like that where they, they just felt so free. And, and the balance, I'm sure, as coaches and as parents and as youth players is just to kind of try to find that really good balance where – you know, you're, you're kind of blending the two and almost being developed with being unaware of how much you're just enjoying loving the game. And you, we've got to have equal, you know, it can't always just be private technical sessions to work on, you know, five different things to have a, a better turn shot. They've got to be able to free play too and have a lot of fun. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, we see this happening with youth clubs across the country, Larry. Um, we see a lot of uh, branding in multiple markets now and expansion by clubs. Uh, I won't I won't name them, uh, but you and I are very aware of the clubs that are doing that at a very aggressive pace here from Southern California. But I also noticed that Blues is also starting to expand as well. And so I just was wondering if you can kind of talk about uh, what maybe the next 10 years in your heart and mind, you know, you hope to establish with taking the, the, the brand um, – and the philosophy that is Southern California blues and starting to expand that in other markets. Um, what that kind of looks like for you guys as an organization. Well, just remember that anything you do, there's strengths and weaknesses. And um, the day of, uh, of clubs being boutiques, it's very, uh, I'm not sure how long that's going to last. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that it's uh, a product of not being good enough. But what we're running up against is other clubs, as you said, uh, branding in other markets and becoming so financially uh, juggernauts there. And it's I don't think the kids are getting paid yet. okay? but there are adults making massive amounts of money. And I think soccer really gets thrown out the window because when I create a, a satellite program, And there's very little quality control. And we just say, okay, now you're wearing our uniforms. Well, nothing's going to change there. Nothing is going to change unless you have some direct influence. And I don't see myself flying all over the country. Uh, When we start a satellite program that is within our vicinity, we can at least go there and, you know, have a relationship with the coaches and the parents and the kids even, which I find the most enjoyable part of doing all this. Um, you got to remember, uh, you know, athletics started basically as a means of, of teaching people principles that they can carry on, you know, in life. And if I had my way, I would coach every player in the world, but we just can't do it. Sure. So we didn't, necessarily start out wanting to uh, uh, form other groups but when we were approached and people needed help and we saw that they fit in our philosophy not whether they had a lot of money or were going to bring us groups because for instance some of the groups that we're associating with only have maybe five or six teams and we're not here to take players from them maybe as a pathway if there's somebody extraordinary and they grow beyond 
a team right. or a club, then they can come aboard and there's a little bit of benefit that way. But uh, most of this is done, unfortunately, for financial reasons. Right. And uh, there's a little bit of a payoff. As long as we, I feel we are unique in that we are extremely honest in our approach. We explain to people that it's really about them and it's really about the kids wanting to be soccer players. If I give uh, people who are passionate a soccer ball, they're going to play with it. They're going to play with it. You know, so um, why uh, is this going to continue? I think it will. And I think we are going to grow but we have to grow in a way that is conducive to our mission. Yeah. And it can't just be, hey, these guys have a lot of money. We have been approached by huge, huge entities, some of them professional groups. Now, why would they approach us? Um, obviously, there's quality here. But at the same time, I think they also have other reasons. Maybe they want to build a fan base. Maybe they want to use our... Uh, clientele to to promote other activities that they're doing it's just the way of the world and our culture yeah, there's always an agenda right yeah correct uh larry to wrap up our conversation you know on the podcast we always end our discussions with with just one question and i'd love to hear your response to it uh you are given uh basically uh free reign to uh to get one wish granted in in u.s soccer landscape um, anything that you would like, uh, but I would love to know one, what would you solve and or change when you may wave that magic wand, when you rub that lamp one, what would you change? And two, what effects that would have on, on the game here in our country? There are so many things that we can be doing. First you get and one, Larry. What's your number one? First, what's your number first one? And foremost, we have the only country where you must pay to be good. Mm -hmm. And in all other countries, if you are a good player or a talented player, they pay for you to play. And what that does is it, it releases the adults and the parents so much that they want to have a say in how things are done. I have so many analogies that I've developed over the years. And one of them is that, hey, you're a doctor. Do I come to your operating room and tell you, no, don't use this, use the scalpel or operate on the heart instead of the liver? No, because I don't have that expertise. You would think that after 40 years of coaching and growing a club that people would say, yeah, maybe this guy knows a little bit about <laughs> what he's doing. Bit, yeah. <laughs> so sure. I have people leave my teams sometimes uh, I had a recent experience where someone who was on the team, they called me, they had committed to play, and they called and said, hey, guess what? We just got an offer to play at this higher level, even though, in my opinion, the player wasn't prepared for that. Um, I'm not going to fight, you know, with the people. Uh, and they go on and they go and do this thing. So, uh, and it's because of their involvement. They don't understand. Now, you know, I know I'm answering another question here oh, it's good but I yeah. very important yeah. culturally as coaches we don't have necessarily an ethical standard and that's the other thing that i would want to see is that there be more cooperation uh i notice that when my kids go to a game my my soccer players they uh the other team will walk by maybe they want to go to the bathroom or something like that and they all stare at each other like cats, you know, like a cat fight. And me, I'm crazy. I'll go, hey, girls, how's it going? H how was your trip? You know, what's going on? Did you do anything fun? It just doesn't exist here. We're so uh, passionate and we have our rivalries and we end up not liking each other to play. And I think that's unhealthy. And we as coaches are responsible more so than soccer. You're not going to save your life by kicking a ball into a soccer net. But what you learn by doing it, if coaches really have the right philosophy, especially with youth, we also have to be teachers and give them some cultural perspective and, you know, how to be a teammate. You have so many various people. Some are super competitive. They'll yell at their teammates and, I, I don't get upset if somebody yells, one of the teammates yells at another one, but then we have to go in and explain how to communicate. Right. 
Right. So this is just an example of the so many lessons that we don't necessarily get give to the kids, but instead we focus on the results and the soccer and so on and so forth. I'm sorry to ramble on, but no, I felt it's good. very it's, good. Yeah, no, it's good. It's it. You know, I never will make people apologize for sharing their heart and the things that they're passionate about. You know, it's, that's that. just the biggest, the best part of it all. So, uh, you know, Marissa, let's get you back in here. Let's kind of get your thoughts as you've been kind of listening in the background of uh, recapping for us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Larry, for sharing all your insights. And, you know, we could probably talk for hours and I could. I was going to say that. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. that. This be <laughs> a 10 hour uh, deal yeah. here. Yeah. I know. Hopefully I Sunday have some funny stories that I never really got to tell. But, yeah, know. well, you know, every time we have a guest on, they always enjoy their time and we always think, you know what, we're going to have to have you come back on. Um, you know, we're all very <laughs> intrigued yep. to to hear, you know, everything and the insight. And, you know, I maybe want to have everyone on at one episode. That would be, I mean, I don't know how. Big old party. Be. Yeah. We'll yeah. Figure uh, it out. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed, you know, especially the end, you kind of tied it up with a bow. Like you have to learn, you're not your coach for soccer, but you're also a teacher. And I think we've had, you know, a, a previous coach mentioned that too. And it's like, these are life lessons they're learning yeah. on the. That is my passion as a yeah. coach. Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody's a little yeah. bit different. Yeah. You're an educator yeah. for sure. In all things <laughs> on and off the field, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, thanks again, Larry. Gosh, your time is, is super valuable to us. The lessons and the wisdom that you've shared with a, a long uh, career in the game and a long attachment to the game is is so valuable. And so we just we are super thankful that you'd honored us with your presence and with the conversation. So thanks again. On the contrary, yes. I want to thank you guys because you're trying to enlighten and educate people about the sport that we love. And uh, every little bit helps. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's true. And yeah. Thanks so much. Larry, how Appreciate can we it. get yeah. connected with you? Like website? Oh. Uh, well, we have a website. Uh, uh, our club has a website uh, and I'm mm -hmm. partially the webmaster. So if you have complaints, <laughs> send them to me. <laughs> um, I'll be sure to send a list. No, sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sam Charlie Blues, scblues.com is the website. And my email address is very easy. It's Larry at scblues.com so those are probably the best ways to get in touch uh, as well all our coaches have their email addresses on there the teams are on there with all the photos and in in that respect it's kept pretty much up to date so it's kind of a yeah. fun uh, site to go and look at and also the history and uh, some of the things that we discuss here are already on there our philosophy and our player parent agreement and so on and so forth so and the number one thing i want to encourage people to do is to go on that website and order one of the super loud super fun socal or southern california blues jerseys because they are the best looking kits in youth in youth soccer as far as i'm concerned so, thank you very much yeah absolutely so yeah. go support the club thanks, thanks so again. much right. for your time my question. Yeah, and that's our episode. And remind you to hit subscribe or follow. And uh, there's some activity outside. I don't know if you hear it. But, I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not. It's not often. They're not. A, they're not at your Tennessee. door. Okay. Good. Yeah. No. No. They're driving by. There's not now I have to get the so. entire club to subscribe. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I need subscribe. A, I need follow. A, like. Uh, I need a logo. I need a logo and I'm going to put it on our uh, social media and hopefully you get uh, more subscribers. Done. Done and Absolutely. done. We got you. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, every ep Our new episodes every Tuesday and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.